This is a bit of an end of an era, ladies and gents. This is the last tectonics video of um, this year. Um, hopefully, next time I talk to you about any kind of tectonics, we'll be in a classroom face to face. Um, but anyway, let's leave that for now. Um, okay, we have talked about the hazards presented by volcanoes. We divided that into two sections, primary and secondary hazards, and you hopefully have filled in a table of your module booklet now, pages 31 and 32, or if you don't have page numbers, um, it's the table that says lava flows, pyroclastic flows, etc, etc. We are then um, going to be skipping a few pages um, because we've just I don't want to rush through tectonics. Some of you are finding it quite tricky and it was either rush it or leave it till the autumn. And I think leaving it till the autumn feels more sensible. So we're missing the stuff on pages 33 to 37 about managing volcanoes, which is all about how do you predict them? How do you monitor them? What do you do if you think it's going to erupt? All that sort of stuff. It, it's only about a lesson lesson or two um, but it just felt a little bit silly to try, try and rush through that now. So we're jumping to the case studies. Now we give you choice about earthquake case studies but we are quite dictatorial about your volcano case studies for lots of reasons that I won't go into but we would really 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 like you to have these two as your two big volcanic case studies. So, Eya Fiatla Jokul, not a very good pronunciation, but passable, uh, which you can definitely shorten to E15 because it begins with an E and it has 15 letters. Um, that is an Icelandic volcano which erupted in 2010. And we're going to be comparing that with a volcano called the Soufrière Hills volcano, although lots of people just refer to it as the volcano on Montserrat. Uh, which erupted uh, in the 1990s because there was actually a series of eruptions. So we would really like you to do those. What I'm going to try to do with this PowerPoint and this video is to give you an introduction to them. But in the email that I will send, you also have a Word document with loads of information. And towards the end of this PowerPoint, there are a load of um, films and documentaries and stuff that you could watch as well. Right, we've picked them because they are very different and they're easy to research. So um, we'll be talking to you about what we want you to do over the summer. And this is the only new bit of work that we want you to do over the summer holidays. Everything else is uh, catching up, refreshing your memory, all of those kinds of things. So these are the only two new things that we want you to do, two case studies of volcanic eruptions. So I'm going to introduce them to you. Okay, E15 Iceland. What do we know about Iceland already? Well we know it's an island on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We know therefore it's on a divergent margin but it is also a hot spot. Okay, so here. Here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here is a hot spot. Notice that hot spots can be at plate margins but they can be wherever the hotspots happen to be, basically. So it's kind of volcanic for two reasons, and that's why they have volcanic eruptions on average once every five to seven years. Volcanoes are just part of life on Iceland. And E15, as you can see here, is highlighted. So it's in the south of Iceland. Um, now, here's one of the interesting things that I really want you to make sure you have a look at. E15 is famous for its ash cloud, that's true, but you at A level need to know that there were two phases to this eruption and phase one was kind of stunningly beautiful and exactly what you would expect it to be. So if you have got your head around lava types, which may have taken you a couple of attempts, what you should know is that divergent margins and hotspots tend to have mafic magma, which is not very viscous, it flows, it runs exactly like you're looking at on the screen. But phase two was completely 
different. Oh, sorry, that's another photo of phase one. Phase two is the rather infamous ash cloud. Uh, some beautiful, just stunning photographs of it. Um, but famous because it grounded loads of flights across Europe, brought Europe to a standstill and just kind of caused chaos basically. So it's very, very famous for its ash cloud, which was phase two of the eruption. Okay, so this is really important level of detail at A-level that there are two completely different phases. Now, why on earth was there an ash cloud? Because we know... Um, its location, we know the kind of magma that is involved. What is different? Well, I need to uh, introduce you to the land of ice and fire, which is kind of Iceland's nickname or tagline, if you like, the land of ice and fire. It has glaciers, it has ice, and it has volcanoes, it has fire. And um, Eja Fiatla Jökull here, right? Here is its uh, sort of magma chamber and um, uh, I can't think of the word, it's can't, sort of where the magma comes from underground. This is phase one, which I am not even going to try to pronounce because I'm just going to sound silly. Phase one, look, the mafic magma came out on bare rock and it came out as lava flows and lava fountains and it was all very, very beautiful. Phase two was underneath ice and that is why there was an ash cloud okay phase one no ice phase two ice so what happens is the magma comes up and it starts erupting and it does two things obviously the ice begins to melt yes and we'll talk about the problems caused by that in a second but also the ice cools the magma and solidifies it. So there's kind of a two-way effect. That is where the ash comes from, all right? So it's simply the difference between the eruption happening not under ice, and then the second phase is underneath a glacier. So you've got a few facts and figures about um, impacts that you can find out. This, All of this is in the Word document. I'm going to email you as well. And this eruption is really good as an example of Jokelhaupts or Jokelhaupts or however on earth you're supposed to pronounce it. So as I said, the problem of lava and ice meeting is that you have a two-way impact. The ice cools the lava, which solidifies it and you get an ash cloud, but also the lava melts the ice and you have these enormous floods. And you can see that the roads got washed away, farmland got flooded, and all of that kind of thing. So E15 um, had quite significant Jokelhaus as well. Nobody died because Iceland is used to this. They have a volcanic eruption once every five to seven years. They know how to handle this. They knew the eruption was coming. They'd evacuated everybody. They repaired the road really quickly afterwards. If you live with a hazard, and it's something that happens often, you get good at dealing with it. And that's exactly what happens in Iceland. And actually, weirdly, um, E15 and other volcanoes have had quite positive impacts on Iceland. So if we talk about E15 specifically, it really boosted their tourism industry. Because I think the ash cloud and the fact it grounded so many flights across Europe meant that everyone was like, where's all this ash coming from? Oh, it's coming from a little country called Iceland. Let's go and visit Iceland. Let's go and have a look at the lava. Let's go and um, investigate this country further. So now, as a result of that, tourism is the main source of income for Iceland, and it used to be fishing. So it's kind of completely transformed their economy, which is real. More generally, the volcanic activity in Iceland is brilliant because it means they can um, use geothermal power. Now, most people in Iceland live here. This is Reykjavik and the surrounding areas. And all of Reykjavik is heated with um, 
geothermal power. So all of people's houses, all of their hot water, their electricity, it all comes from geothermal sources. They wouldn't have that geothermal power if they didn't have the volcanoes. So volcanoes can have positive impacts as well. The other significance of this map, which is um, a population density map actually, is just to prove if most people live in and around Reykjavik, it's quite easy to manage the volcanoes in the rest of the country because they have so few people living in different areas. It's quite easy to evacuate them, it's quite easy to manage. And right at the start of the module we talked about how Chai Ten was an eruption in South America that wasn't predicted because basically no one knew it was a volcano particularly, um, hadn't erupted for thousands of years and nobody died but that was sort of luck because nobody really lived near the volcano. You could argue that as well as the fact that Iceland is really, really brilliant at dealing with volcanoes, that the fact they have a low population density does also reduce the risk. Okay. Now, I'm not gonna play any of those. Suffice to say, they are all documentaries about E15. Um, they are quite interesting, they have footage that I cannot show you um, and I would highly recommend that you check those out if you could. Okay, so Montserrat, Caribbean. We are in the Lesser Antilles, so let me just remind you. The Lesser Antilles is here, so North America, South America, Caribbean, right, you're looking at that bit and I've zoomed in here. This is a subduction zone, all right? You've got the Atlantic plate and the Caribbean plate. These um, two are moving towards each other. So this is a convergent margin, oceanic to oceanic, which means when your um, subducted plate is melted and the melt rises to form volcanoes, those volcanoes produce an island arc, which is a sort of semicircle, if you like, of volcanoes. One of those is the Soufriere Hills volcano here on the island of Montserrat. So we've got a completely different kind of plate margin. Remember, that should give us, or does give us, a completely different kind of volcano. So some of you might find this diagram a little bit more helpful. So it just labels subduction. Here's the Lesser Antilles here. Here's the subduction that's going on. Haiti, just as a little aside, Haiti you might choose to do as one of your earthquake case studies and that's actually on a strike slip, aka transform, aka conservative margin, where the plates are moving past each other. Um, so you may revisit this part of the world for your earthquake case study. But for now, we're interested in Montserrat which is in the Lesser Antilles. It's part of a convergent margin. So, Montserrat, what do you need to know about it? It's a tiny island. Please let me draw your attention to this scale. Everybody on that island lives near a volcano because it's impossible not to live near the volcano. The whole island is created by volcanic activity. Okay, um, it's an interesting mix of people. It's really hard to uh, kind of talk about levels of development on Montserrat because local people would not be particularly wealthy, but there are quite a few wealthy, or there used to be pre the eruption, quite a few wealthy Brits and Americans who uh, lived there as well. So yeah, um, what I would say, what is much more clear cut is they did not know that the volcano was going to erupt. They were not prepared for the eruption. So in terms of levels of preparation, you couldn't get much more different between Iceland and Montserrat. Most people on the island had absolutely no idea they lived on a volcano. They, like, they had absolutely no idea. Which, I know the instant reaction is to think, gosh, these people must be stupid. But if the volcano's not erupted for hundreds or thousands of years, people forget. That's just human nature. People forget that, you know, anything bad might ever happen. 
Um, and let's be honest, humans, we like to be optimistic, don't we? We like a bit of hope. Anyway, if you've never heard of Montserrat, you might want to do a little bit of um, digging. This is just, as you can see, some information purely about the island, if you've never heard of it, um, and that sort of thing. Okay, so quite a different kind of a volcano to the one uh, that we mentioned in Iceland. This clearly is silicic or felsic or acidic lava, whichever name you want to use. Uh, much more viscous. Remember, it instantly solidifies when your volcano erupts, turns to pumice. The pumice then, uh, by the force of the explosion, then gets ground down into ash particles. What you can see here are pyroclastic flows. So this volcano, the Sufria Hills volcano, is characterised by ash clouds and pyroclastic flows. Completely different impacts. You can see the destruction. It's changed the shape of the coastline completely. Devastated villages, devastated farmland. I mean, you just can see, can't you? It's uh, incredible. And that's a slightly different view. And that used to be the capital city, ladies and gents. This is Plymouth, which used to be the capital, and successive eruptions with pyroclastic flows and ash have completely destroyed it, so it is now abandoned. The population has taken a massive hit. So uh, the first big eruption was in 1995, uh, the worst eruption, I should just say, was in 1997, but the late 90s uh, was a series of, of volcanic eruptions. It's still rumbling now, it's, it's definitely um, still active and still dangerous as a volcano. So you can see the impact that the volcano had on the population of Montserrat. So you could talk here about forced migration. Remember, it doesn't matter whether the thing that is threatening you is human or physical. If you are forced to move because you fear for your life, it is forced migration. Um, and you've also got some uh, other global governance stuff here because Montserrat is an overseas British territory, which means that the people of Montserrat were legally allowed to move to the UK if they wished to, and most of them did. Um, so there's been some interesting links between kind of the whole British Empire, Commonwealth stuff, um, and volcanic activity in Montserrat. Um, that's their flag, so I think you would agree the links to the UK are fairly obvious. <laughs> um, and we do largely uh, supply their operating budget um, sorry, I, the word amounting has gone across two sentences for which I apologise. But yeah, this is an overseas British territory, so we've got some really nice links back to the global governance module. Now, what I would argue is that Montserrat has been much more badly affected than Iceland. Iceland got back on its feet very quickly. They didn't need to change their behavior very much because they already handled their volcanoes excellently. Montserrat is still recovering. I mean, um, if I just go back to this, notice that the southern bit of the island is still a completely in the exclusion zone. You're not allowed to go there overnight. People who live there can't live there anymore. This is still a dangerous volcano and the island you know, it still looks like this. They are beginning to attract tourists back, um, and I've included a hyperlink there for you. Um, you're not allowed, well, I think you can stay in some hotels, but most people stay on other Caribbean islands and just go for the day or go for a, her a helicopter tour. But anyway, yeah, there's always a link between volcanoes and tourism because most of us are sort of slightly nosy slash, I don't know, uh, completely obsessed with volcanoes, but there's definitely something. But for me, one of the biggest things for you to know about is there is now, this is the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. Having not really known uh, that they lived on a volcano prior to 1995, I think most of the residents are pretty damn clear that they live on a volcano. And they now have one of the most advanced uh, volcano 
monitoring stations on the planet. Um, and actually, I think it had quite a lot to do with Bristol University, interestingly. Uh, Bristol Uni is, is um, full of some of the world's leading volcanologists, and I think some of them set up the MVO. So having had no volcano management, they've now got one of the best monitoring stations in the world. And one of the things we're quite interested in, in the hazards module, is kind of learning from our hazards, learning how to handle them better, learning um, yeah, how we could improve for the future. The VDAP that we already looked at with Nevado del Ruiz and um, Pinatubo is an excellent example, but I think Montserrat is brilliant too. And then I've just found um, some links and some videos for you to watch. Now, this what I'm about to show you is highly unlikely. If by any miracle, you have that DVD kicking around at home. <laughs> there is a really good section on Montserrat. I think the chances are slim to nil and I have got it. And when we're back in the classroom, I will show it to you. But it, oh, do you know, it's just a lovely series. It really is. Um, you just basically feel like you're going around the Caribbean with Trevor McDonald, which is no bad thing. So, um, yeah, if, if you think it's kicking around at home, it's I've looked everywhere on the internet, YouTube and BBC iPlayer, and it's just not anywhere at the moment. Um, but anyway, I shall leave that there. I managed to buy it. I bought a second copy actually the other day for less than a pound. So if you're feeling like, you would desperately want to watch that DVD. It won't break the bank, um, but I shall leave that entirely up to you. Sorry. So they are some that I, well, you can definitely access because they're on the internet. That one, maybe, but I will show it to you in class anyway. So please don't worry too much. And that's just a very short summary, um, which some of you might want to screenshot, print out, copy, whatever. Okay, so you've got this PowerPoint, which is in the hazards folder, that's its name, number nine dash volcanic case studies. That's the PowerPoint. You've got this video and you've got a Word document. That should be plenty. Um, but for those of you who are quite visual and or just fancy watching a few videos and a bit of telly, check out the hyperlinks that I showed you in here. Um, and that, as I said, is the only new task, if you like, that we are asking you to do over the summer holidays. That's the last video, ladies and gents. Um, I'm very much sort of hoping that, uh, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed doing them, but I think we're all ready for a bit of normality, aren't we? Um, but we'll see. Anyway, thank you.